Hello and welcome to Teaching My Cat to Read, the very serious book review podcast. I'm Eli. I'm Em. And I'm Lottie. And this week we're discussing everything about Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte. Jingle, jingle, jingle. <laughs> it's gonna be you have to say that. it, it's very important. I know, it's just in my head. It's in my head. <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to start with the usual disclaimer that this is not a spoiler-free podcast, and we may even, in fact, start on the spoilers from the very first second with this one, because it's classic, you've heard it all before. Honestly, if you're worried about being spoiled, don't don't read this book, just listen to the podcast. Like, go and read a yeah. plot synopsis, maybe. <laughs> We will be spoiling this book, but um, obviously we assume that it, as it's a classic, you either know an, some of it through pop culture already, watch an adaptation. So hopefully, um, yeah. Listen to the Kate Bush song. I want to talk yeah. about the adaptations, actually. I haven't watched <laughs> any of them, but I've read summaries yeah. and apparently some of them changed some stuff. So um, you still yeah. have the, if you've yeah. only ever seen an adaptation, you might still have the potential to be spoiled by the original. Yeah, mm. definitely. Um, terrible summary. Yeah, do we want to lead with a terrible summary? Yeah, terrible yes. summary. Um, <laughs> well, so mine would be and Catherine are not in love and this book is miserable also surprise it doesn't involve just Heathcliff and Catherine <laughs> see I just went with everything a goddamn ordeal in area family <laughs> I don't know what my terrible summary would be it would be like hey surprise your racism came back to haunt your entire family <laughs> well 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 if it isn't the consequences of my own actions yeah. yeah. Shockingly, terrible parenting has consequences. Yeah. News yeah. just in. The other one I think is I feel like there is a meme somewhere that expresses what I'm trying to what my whole vibe on this book and I mm. cannot remember which one it is, but there's somebody is in the foreground just like with a yikes face on and then yeah. in the background everything's on fire and then it's like welp not my problem kind of. Yeah. Everything's on fire in the background. Have you guys read this book before? Because nope. I don't. Because I hadn't. I hadn't read this book a I long just... time ago. I I read it when I was in my pretentious teenage. I'm going to read classic literature because I'm smarter than everybody. Phase, uh... and then I instantly forgot everything that happened. Yeah. So, I actually I read the Daphne du Maurier that it, this that is based on this, mm-hmm. um, possibly obsessively in my later teens. So I'm very familiar with that one and less with this. Yeah. Everybody just read the Loving Spirit instead of this. It's, yeah. You, honestly, you'll have a much better time. <laughs> Right, so we've given our summary, and I think mm. our impressions are mostly like, yeah, d- don't don't worry about reading this. You know, you know if, if your English teacher <laughs> makes you, then maybe consider it's it. It's miserable as. F- it's so yeah. miserable. Um, and from now on, I think we are not going to avoid spoilers. Yeah, we will be soon spoilers. I think we need to just to have a plot summary of this book. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so patriarch of terrible family brings home random orphan. Random orphan falls in love with one daughter and then in- into eternal loathing with the son. Mm. Terrible parenting happens. Everybody gets married to the wrong people and have kids. Everybody dies, apart from Heathcliff, who's the random orphan. Um, and then the next generation mm. all get married, but like sequentially, not yeah. all at once. Okay. That would be- Initially to the wrong people and then... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, like what surprised me is because I hadn't read this book before. I'd only Mm. knew about it through pop culture. So I knew Heathcliff and Catherine were Mm. a like lovers or in love and there's a tragedy. One or both, I assume, dies. And Mm. what surprised me is this book is, in my opinion, it is not about their relationship at all. It's about the consequences Mm. of their actions. Mm. And the fact that this book has effectively three generations Mm -hmm. and it effectively plots out the impact of having favoritism of a child to an extreme level Mm. as it propagates through those through those three generations. So if you haven't read the book before, you've got the Earnshaws and the the Lintons. So you've got Daddy Linton and Mummy Linton. Daddy Linton goes off to Liverpool and finds... No, that's the Earnshaws. No, wait, these, these are Earnshaws. Is that the babe. Earnshaws? <laughs> yep. Oh, <laughs> the, my the Lintons are the nice are the nice pretty princess ones that lives across the hill, I'm, yeah. I'm an idiot. Ignore everything I said, Roken. <laughs> okay, listen, character-wise, this is very confusing. The vibe I got from this book was more like... So, okay, in the Icelandic sagas, there's a specific one that they make you do... And, or at least the, uh, my, my university made us do. If you take Old Norse, they're like, we're going to do the sagas of the Icelanders, which is basically EastEnders, but like mm. it's li- literary fiction EastEnders, but with 
medieval yeah. Iceland. You know, Wuthering Heights is very EastEnders. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, this is the thing. I could yeah. not get my head around them, right? Because, like, I was very... Bo- it seemed like it was three or four generations of the same family. They all have the same names. Yeah. And they all get into the same kinds of trouble that they inherited from the previous generation. And I can't follow it at all. And this is the exact vibe I got from so Wuthering Heights. So, is there a single happy marriage <laughs> yeah. in this book? No. I know. I literally I had to pull know. up a family tree. I think... I feel I feel like Hareton and Kathy 2.0. Yeah. Oh yes, has that's the, the happy ending. The, the bittersweet ending, yes. They sort of overcome like the Earnshaw so Earnshaw adopts Heathcliff, mm-hmm. the orphan, and then basically makes Heathcliff the favoured child. So Hindley, who is the eldest son. The older brother. I guess the, the biological son, gets mm. jealous of Heathcliff. And so then he sends Hindley away. Then the dad dies. And so Hindley inherits everything. Hindley just goes off on Heathcliff and makes him like a labourer in the house that he grew up in. And then they have a have a sister, Catherine. And then Hindley's son, Hareton, um, mm. is born at some point. Catherine and Heathcliff is obviously the main, uh, I guess I say mm. plot, but like the main one. If you've heard it in pop culture. And they're, they're, they're sort of in love, but it's really they're more codependent, you know? Yeah, yeah, they're codependent yeah, yeah. on each other because of the brutality of the father. I, I was going to say that was the thing that that like really struck me actually after like seeing this, watching this. Actually, let finish the plot summary. Finish the plot summary, yeah. and then we'll. Do, I was just we'll going to go feelings. through like all the characters. So, um, <laughs> Catherine, Catherine Earnshaw is in. I say love. I don't think love's the right word. Like codependent relationship mm. with Heathcliff because of the mm. abusive father. Yeah, trauma bonded. And then basically, Catherine ends up having to marry. I, in my opinion, it's it's slightly due to the restrictions of the time, and I don't think it's fair on Catherine to say that she could have she couldn't really have married Heathcliff because they were treated as brother and sister, so that's a bit weird. Anyway, but so she marries basically the only I guess eligible family in the Yorkshire Moors in their vicinity, <laughs> um, the Lintons, who have yeah. their their like higher social class. So she yeah. marries Edgar, who they're not really matched at all in personality or anything and Heathcliff gets very upset with this Mm -hmm. so Heathcliff marries Edgar's sister Isabella in revenge almost you know in revenge not only that he grooms her basically kidnaps her he basically kidnaps her and grooms her uh, like as an impressionable teenager it reminds me of um, Lydia in Mm. Wickham in Pride and Prejudice a little bit yes it really did because she's 18 at this point yeah Mm. and the reason Heathcliff marries her is to try and basically do one over on Edgar because Edgar and Catherine have a girl they have a they have a child called Cathy which is very confusing and so Heathcliff's right okay if me and Isabel have a boy then he will inherit the Linton's money and I like you say Edgar and Cathy have a girl Cathy one dies in childbirth yes so so basically Heathcliff knows to do one over on Edgar he just basically has to have a son so he kidnaps Isabel, marries her. They have a son called Linton. Then yeah, mm-hmm. and it's worth mentioning Isabella, but was born Isabella Linton, right? Mm. And yes. then she marries Heathcliff, yes. and Heathcliff only has the one name, so she becomes Isabella Heathcliff, and then has a son that she calls Linton, yeah. who then goes on to interact with Kathy Linton, the son of Edgar Linton and Kathy Earnshaw, and it's just it makes it, no sense. Infuriating. I hate it so much. So annoying. Like there are other names, bitch. You're not the Tudors. It's also like Heathcliff to get one over on not only the Lintons but the Earnshaws mm. is Hurton, the child of um, Hindley, his I guess adoptive, mm. his brother, foster brother. Yeah, mm. yeah, foster yeah. brother. Basically makes Hurton like who he can't read, he can't write, and he basically makes him like a labourer. So he mm. just pushes his his I guess, social standing whilst also in- inducing some kind of Stockholm syndrome. Well, he wins the so he wins the estate off of Hindley by gambling. Yeah, by gambling. Yes. So there's like there's layers to this. There's the yeah. interpersonal. Sh- there's the there's the romance. Sh- there's the property. Sh- there's a period when Heathcliff. So basically, Kathy Kathy one marries Edgar Linton, and Heathcliff like runs away because he's like you know infuriated and heartbroken and so on. Mm-hmm. And he goes away and he makes his fortune mm-hmm. by some unspecified means that we never find out, and it's implied to be kind of shady. Yeah, he comes back to. Th- this bit of Yorkshire goes to stay in Wuthering Heights with Hindley who owns it and hates him but can't turn him out because that would be like mm. it would look really bad and so Heathcliff basically goes swindles him out of all of his money by gambling because Hindley mm. loves to gamble and yeah. basically takes the estate from him Hindley dies and then he takes Hareton Earnshaw um, mm-hmm. and there's um there's like this weird thing where his wife Isabella has at this point run away 
to give birth to the son. Yeah. Mm. And so he's basically like, if you don't let me keep Hareton Earnshaw, who should really go and live mm. with you guys, then yeah. mm. I will go and track down my son who is currently living happily with his mother far away from me. And he's like, it's like he's using his own yeah. awfulness as a bargaining chip yeah. almost. But anyway, there's this point yeah. where he and Hindley are both living at Wuthering Heights and um, Heathcliff brings Isabella back after they've got married and Hindley goes to Isabella and says, look, you make sure that his door is locked every night because every night I go with my gun to his door and try and kill him. And the only reason I don't is because the door is locked and I can't get in. And it's just so funny to me, this idea of these these housemates who just absolutely yeah. ate each other's guts. And one of them tries to go and yeah. kill the other one every night in his sleep and just doesn't because the door is locked. It's so funny. <laughs> it, it, it reminds me of the Princess Bride thing of the yeah. good night, Wesley, sleep well. I'll most likely kill you in the morning. Exactly. <laughs> it's, just, it's like, but it's not only that, then you've got the added layer of... This entire story is mm. you're introduced this family through this lodger, um, Lockwood. He goes to um, take up rent in Thrushcross Grange. That's the one, Thrushcross Grange. So Thrushcross Grange and Wuthering Heights are like the two... Is where the Lintons did live, but there's none of them left at this point, mm. I think. Yeah, and they're the two houses in like the Yorkshire Moors. Everything around them is very far away. So the whole thing's centred around these two houses. And he goes and takes up residence in Thrushcross Grange. Mm. So you're introduced to all of these players or like the the, the third generation effectively at mm. very early on in the book. And because um, Lockwood goes to meet them and it's kind of his descriptions of how uh, Heathcliff was very rude, how he wasn't a gentleman, how there was this girl there who was very mm. pretty and he's like, oh, who are you married to? And he's like just <laughs> all over everything. <laughs> it's like kicking everything off in this house. <laughs> he's so useless. He's f- useless. It's really Just funny. Just f- firmly in mouth at every opportunity, yeah. And he's like, I haven't got yeah. a clue what's going on here. So he goes to the housekeeper, Nelly, to get her to explain. And so mm. it's told through mm. his diaries. He gets sick. He Basically, he's a consumptive Victorian heroine. He goes to this house. He gets kicked out because he's yeah, such a... He's well, a not, bit of a twat. Well, because they're awful, but also because he's just like... Mm. He has foot in mouth disease, but good. And so he gets kicked out into the snow. So he's sick until like the next year. And while that's going on, his housekeeper basically like Scheherazade style is telling him this story every night to make him go to sleep. And it's worth noting that this housekeeper, Ellen Dean, lived at the Mm -hmm. house Mm -hmm. when um, Big Daddy uh, um, Earnshaw Mm -hmm. brought back Heathcliff. So she and first Kathy and Hindley and Heathcliff all grew up together. And she was a servant, so she wasn't quite... You know, but she she was mm. like a she knows all the players in the in the story and like she does very yeah. very well. She has all the yeah. tea. Yeah, and uh- <laughs> I, know, I know we're still kind of doing the summary, but there's something that we haven't really mentioned that I was really really surprised mm. when I actually read this properly. So Heathcliff is mm. very obviously a person of color. Mm-hmm. Like, really obviously yeah. in the narrative. And it's just, I'm, you know, I, I knew that that was a theory. And I thought it was on the same level as the theory that Gatsby of the Great Gatsby might be a, a white passing person yeah. of colour. And that that gives a lot mm-hmm. more context to the book. And I hope we're going to do the Great Gatsby at some point because mm. I really want to talk yeah. about that theory in particular. And I thought it was mm. just like, oh, wouldn't this be an interesting reading? But then you actually read it and he's so obviously portrayed as a mixed race. Yeah, no, it is. It, it is explicit. And I that was, yeah. it just hasn't been passed down in the popular reception at no. all. I don't think. I don't think I've, I, I was not aware until I reread this. Yeah. He's so obviously not. And it influences, yeah. it, it, it gives so much context to everybody's treatment of him. And it makes Kathy a little bit more sympathetic, honestly, because she's going against the grain of her time to not treat him as mm. lower or to treat him as so similar to herself. I don't know. I wanted, I wanted to talk about this, actually, because that's, well, yeah, because this is this. Mm-hmm. Okay, so we wanted to talk about duality at some yeah, point. I think yeah, we've I covered think we most of the main beats of the... Uh, we'll, we'll get the rest of it in, in context, I think. Basically, it's generational trauma uh, is, is the main theme of this book, yeah. I would say. Pretty much, yeah. And yeah, so there's a there's a line that I think kind of sums up the Heathcliff Kathy relationship that I really like, which is the um he is mm. more myself than I am. I know everybody goes on about the whatever souls are made of, his and mine and the same. But I think this tracks with the whole what why do Heathcliff and Kathy Kathy's stories end differently if they are both the same they're essentially they're not the same person, but they are very, very alike. I right? think gender They are very much mirrors to each other. And yeah, like I think the gender is one thing. So like Kathy can't just go running off onto the moors mm. whenever she wants to. She can't be as awful as him because her future is yeah. less secure money wise. She has to at least tone herself down in order to grab to bag a husband. And then she proceeds to be awful to him yeah. afterwards. See, it's interesting because I don't know that she 
does necessarily. Like, he proposes to her literally after she's just slapped him. That's a I good point, yes. I very rarely get the impression, with the exception of the kind of... She behaves more ladylike with the Lintons because if she's ladylike with the Lintons, yeah. then she gets praise mm. and affection in a way she doesn't at home. Maybe right? that's it. And, and, and Heathcliff, even if he is nice, mm. doesn't get that from anybody who, who isn't already giving it to him when he's awful. There's nobody who conditionally gives him love based on being nice. Either they hate him or they like him and what he does mm. doesn't change things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's interesting, I think, because the other the other main difference. So I think she gets the 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 opportunity yeah. to be in that position with the Lintons, where mm-hmm. they love her and they favor her, and she ends up marrying their kid because she's a pretty yeah. white girl. Yes, right. Because they go the first time they meet the Lintons, they go to Thrushcross. Yeah, I can't f- pronounce that. I hate Thrushcross it. Thrushcross Grange. Thrushcross. Yeah. 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 <laughs> They, I'm calling it Fancy House from now on. They go to Fancy House together on one of their like little rambles. Yeah. Or, well, I say rambles. They're tears across the moor. And Heathcliff gets thrown out. For, mm. They assume that they're thieves. And Heathcliff gets thrown out and nearly beaten. And Kathy gets brought in. Well, she does get also bitten by a dog. Yes. But she gets looked after. But she gets looked after, yeah. Yeah, they take her in and look after her and they refuse to listen to Heathcliff saying, This is my this is my foster sibling. If you're taking her in, you ought to take me in. And he I mean he yeah, he nearly gets beaten for trying to do like, you know, come into the house with his friend. Well it's above his yeah. place, you see, right? They just assume looking at him. Yeah, so I mean there's intertwining racism and classism, yes. but I think they're Yeah, like, he's been brought up in this position of like I say e- equal is not the right word. I can't think what the right word is, but in terms of his siblings, mm. or Lies Hindley and Catherine, he's been mm. in an elevated position above his brother because the the father favoured him, and and so mm-hmm. in that mm. environment, he's he's somewhat, I guess, uh, doesn't have the exposure to the quote outside world where he's mm. not treated in that in that position anymore you know he goes there and he's 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 they assume he's a thief mm. and they go no you can't come in but we'll look after Catherine. <laughs> yeah i say he's a brute like which i don't think you would i don't think just class alone considering that no. they've both been running riot yeah. and like they are a, every single kid in that house is neglected by a different parental figure that in a way that amounts to a similar level of ne- like mm. Yes. Overall neglect, I think. Because the wife, uh, Earnshaw's wife, mm. hates Heathcliff. Yeah. Mm. Um, yeah. And there's another theory that it, that is Heathcliff is actually mm. Earnshaw's biological child because uh, Earnshaw used to go mm. to Liverpool all the time on mm. like business and stuff. And he just mm. happens to come across this orphan who he happens to know exists and who is, you know, mm. so maybe Heathcliff isn't actually an orphan until Earnshaw dies. Yeah. And that would explain, that would give context to the wife's hatred yeah. of him. And I don't know about mm. you guys, but because I came into this thinking it was yeah. a, it was more like a Romeo and Juliet style romantic tragedy where everyone dies at the end. And mm. I, I kind of think it's because the entire, like in, in my head, the entire plot is nothing. It's not romantic on any sort of sense of the word it is about it well, is, it's about mm. like on that note i think there is a romeo and juliet comparison well i guess it's more like in a sense of if 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 you're there is no romance in this at all or two houses both are like in dignity well and also the neglect and feud yeah. of the parents um passing itself down to tr- trauma for the children yeah so there's like the feud aspect but more from like mm. a like a love romantic aspect if if you're coming it from a pure Pride mm. and Prejudice, for example, is a romantic novel. Everyone ha- ends up happy at the end. Even Lydia and Wicked, mm. they end up happy at the end. Mm. Oh, like as per the book. I we, mean, probably not, but in the grand, in, like, in terms of like how it's written in the book, mm. Wickham is still around. D- yeah, he's he's, he's still mm. like, oh, it's fine. Whereas in this, I feel if I'd came mm. into it knowing it was not romantic, that it like the the I like I love the mm. the language of this book. Uh, the descriptiveness of this book is beautiful. Mm, like, same, yeah. It's very evocative. I listened to it on audiobook and it was read by mm. Juliet Stevenson. And honest to God, if you're thinking of listening to an audiobook, listen mm. to hers because she does all of the Yorkshire accents and she changes the broadness of it depending on who's speaking. So if it's somebody who's like more of a oh, neighbor cool. who might have a more broader Yorkshire accent, it goes more broad. Like Joseph's was very broad. So when, say, Catherine goes to Linton, she changes the accent to make it less broad. Well, it's code switching, yeah. Yeah, and it and I, I just thought that was a, it was such an interesting 
addition to the story like it really made it you made you notice that class mm. difference i mean i guess if english is not your first language you might have difficulty mm. understanding the broader yorkshire accents but i really really would recommend it i mean to be fair i had di- i had difficulty reading it like mm. i don't i don't actually know yeah. a single thing that joseph said because <laughs> i just i couldn't be bothered to keep flicking to the to the footnotes to work out what the f- he was saying yeah so i would yeah really recommend if you're struggling to read it listen yeah. to juliet stevens it was Honestly, it was brilliant. Um, that was yeah. like, and um, yeah, made me really annoyed at yeah. everybody. <laughs> <laughs> but going back to the um, the Romeo yeah. and Juliet thing, like, so because Heathcliff has this vendetta against the Lintons and yeah. the Earnshaws, and mm. what that translates to for the younger generation, so Linton, his son, Hareton Earnshaw, his sort of nephew, and Kathy Linton, his sort of niece, um, is that this? Mm. It basically sets up this sign of love triangle between them, and Heathcliff kind of behind the scenes, like manipulating yeah. it all. And it is, I think, there is yeah, a comparison to the Romeo and Juliet there, where it's the neglect mm. and feuding of elders ruining the lives of the young yeah. people. Mm. And you know, Kathy Linton, the yeah. young Kathy, ends up happily married to Hareton Earnshaw after, un- after working through and unlearning some of the mm. shit that has been mm-hmm. passed down by their parents, mm. their respective parents. And that's kind of the happy mm. ending is not only that they end up happily married, but they end up better people. Yeah. Yeah. See, I've got to say, I like, I think I feel I'm in two minds about that. Because on the one hand, I like, I'm happy that the book has a, a reasonably yeah. happy ending and they find each other and that they're, yeah, that they have that, they clearly have that romance. But they work for it. And you know, that Nelly gets yeah. to live with them and they're all a bit blissful. Yeah. But we don't see that. I feel, I feel okay. cheated personally a little bit. I thought, I, I felt satisfied by it. I'm glad they got it. And I don't, I do think it's clear that yeah. they have the the relationship that they have. But the fact is, I slogged through an entire extremely miserable book in which the motivations of most of the characters were completely beyond me, because <laughs> because for for like a, like a paragraph at the end where it's like, oh yeah, they have the kind of romance that you actually like to read about. Bye. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's it's, it's sort of it's sort of shoot it, not shoehorned in is the wrong word, but this book is so hmm. I say miserable. It's not like it's a miserable read, but it's just so. In a similar way... It's full of misery. Yeah, it's full of misery. That, that That's a better way of putting mm. it. And I think also, Nelly, <laughs> she puts herself in like, mm. I say victim mode, so f***ing much. And she's telling Look with mm. this story. And yeah. she's like, oh, I was trying to look after this child. And I think it was it was like one of them, She it, it, it's like one of these things, like Kathy was, I think, worried about um her dad, when her dad was very sick, so Kathy two, Catherine two point young Kathy, Edgar, uh, mm-hmm. Edgar's very sick, and so she's basically talking to Nelly and saying, "Oh, you know what happens if you and Dad die before me? Like, you know what happens as you would when you're seventeen and you got, you know." And Nelly just goes, "Well, you could mm. die first. and I'm like, "The f-? like how how?" And, and I've just well, it's so- interesting <laughs> to see. This is something that um, Emma and I were talking about this earlier. The, the change in how Nelly approaches situations over time, because you see in, in the earlier parts mm. of the book, she really does try to empathize with Heathcliff and yeah. encourage better aspects of his nature. And it just fails yeah. completely. She's not an enabler. She, she, she refuses yeah. to, she will provide boundaries. She will say, look, here is how you can take action. To- yeah. When I was saying like, there's nobody who will conditionally mm. love Heathcliff based on him being nice. Yeah. She is the closest that, that, that in the book to that is that she really says like you know it will be better for you if you try and behave and learn yeah. to you know moderate yourself but it doesn't work yeah. but i have a lot more time for nelly uh, like than i think maybe lottie do, does yeah. because i feel i feel like of all that thinking about love in this book i think she is the only person in it that seems to be at all capable of something that i would recognize mm-hmm as love, like she's the clo- one that comes the closest to the unconditional thing. I would say that- Edgar for Edgar for yeah. Kathy too. Like, I mean, Hindi takes a fucking knife to her mouth, and she's just like, "Can yeah. you kill me with a cleaner knife?" You know, she's like, she doesn't give up on anyone really. But uh, until we get to the second generation, I feel like that it's really interesting that I think that's the tipping point for her. By yeah. the time the kids come round, she's just so goddamn yeah. tired. Yep. You know, with Heathcliff and Catherine on multiple occasions, we see her try to explain Mm -hmm. what it is that they've done wrong, how that they can how they can fix their relationships. I don't think, you know, she's not perfect. I think there are there are definitely moments where she chooses to withhold information or to give information when she doesn't have the Mm. right. And I don't think it helps. 
But it, I think it comes from a very much her not knowing yeah. what's best to do. Because the people around her are so f***ed up, like, <laughs> you know. And also, like, she's tr- she is trying to protect herself as well and her job. You know, she can't lose her job. Mm. Mm. I don't... Um, I don't know how much that... Like, I know she's an unreliable narrator. She does, she does push a lot of boundaries with that regard. She, she does push boundaries, though. Like, I think she... I think this is what yeah. kind of annoyed me because I've, I've just made loads of notes to just say Nelly's emo- being just emotionally abusive and gaslighting mm. of multiple different people. And I don't know if that's just because she grew up, when she grew up in this abusive household, mm. she herself was not being physically or emotionally yeah. abused by old Mr. Earnshaw, but she was in that environment. And as a mm. result, she's... I mean, she was witnessing yeah. it and these people that she loves mm. being hurt and twisted and also like you know she mm. means she's you know a housemaid she grew up there she probably hasn't be- lived any literally anywhere else and been around many people and the entire setup of this novel is mm. they're very isolated away from everybody else and yeah mm-hmm. oh, it's funny really because it does technically fit the austin adage yeah. of two or three families in a country village is a thing to focus a novel on but it is literally just two families and the only outsiders we mm. see like the doctor and the lawyer mm-hmm. are both horrible enablers like <laughs> people who i mean the doctor on multiple occasions is like oh you could just let your wife die it's not like she's good for anything mm-hmm. you know like things that he actually says with his face and then the lawyer like is uh, manipulated by heathcliff into not sorting out the will so that like Baby, as Kathy 2.0 is essentially black, kidnapped and blackmailed into marrying her awful cousin. Also, all the property yeah. goes to Heathcliff in the end. You know, the only, so those are the only, that and Nelly, and I think maybe the new mm. housekeeper, they're the only outsiders we see, and they all contribute to the toxicity of this environment. And at the start, I think it's mm. you get this sort of, you feel sorry for Heathcliff because he is in this really horrible Mm. situation and you feel sorry for Mm. for Catherine and you kind of feel like oh if you know that they they've Mm. grown up together and they clearly have feelings for each other and then the split when Catherine one gets married to Edgar like Heathcliff Mm. just absolutely nosedives and by the end of it like I just made this note of so Mm -hmm. he just he's completely losing his by the end of Mm. this book I just put like Jesus, Emily Bronte is not cutting the mustard for this whole like child having issues bit and nature versus <laughs> nurture through this out this whole book because yeah like Heathcliff mm. is just like physically abusing Kathy 2.0 and then mm. Catherine Kathy 2.0 finally stands up to Heathcliff. Heathcliff goes off on the rails and then he does mm. I- I'm pretty sure and I'm like I've made a note of it mm. and I'm not sure if I misheard it. But he opened Catherine 1.0's coffin mm-hmm. so he can lie next to her in death. And I was like, yep. what the f*** is... Like, yep. this- <laughs> yeah, it's, it's okay, deeply... Okay, so this, I actually... Yeah. Hey, I want to yeah. actually bring this back to the romance question because I want to say, I think part of part of the problem, I think, is the... Is the um, just generally the drift we have towards mm-hmm. the Christian greys of relationships in modern pop culture where we think that's romantic. Yeah. Romantic with a little r. But I think part of the misconception okay. is the semantic drift thing. Because I think what this book is intended to be okay. is capital R romantic. Yes. In the sense of, like Frankenstein is to an yeah. extent, or the anything by, she- you know, the like... It's a grand a, a, Interested in the sublime and c- the sublime of nature and high passions that are like beyond most mortal ken and, you know, transcendent mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. emotional you know and you get all the like the pathetic fallacy of like the weather reflecting emotions and all of that stuff and i think that is partially where some of this confusion arises i will also say that the the actual romance is the bit where i lose track yeah. of this book quite a lot like i like i think emily bronte is mm. a great character writer i feel like up until about midway through this book i find every single one of the characters very clearly drawn i find their motives easy to follow mm. i understand why they are that why they have become mm. the terrible people they have become mm-hmm. what i don't get is the level of like catherine and uh, first catherine and heathcliff's just like what is going on? <laughs> do you, what do you I, even I think like, like they, each they, other? I don't. Well, that's the what? thing. It's like because they 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 conceive of themselves as being almost one person, yeah. and the fact that they don't mm. even seem to like each other, I think, says something about their attitudes yeah. towards themselves. Oh, that's a good point. That's a very good and, point. And also yeah. that you know they are both brought up in this very. It, it's described mm. as very bleak, but you know, very windswept. 
uh, remote part of the Yorkshire Moors, which is very evocative, like you say, of mm. the whole, you know, weather describing their moods and everything being cloudy and misty mm. and uh, mysterious. Yeah. But I, I, I don't know. I feel mm-hmm. like maybe it's just because for me, I found this book very difficult to read not because i i love i mean it's like emily bronte mm. using this language wrote like a happy mm. clappy pride and prejudice esque mm. book i'd love it i know she i know no, no, i wouldn't. know she wouldn't but like the yeah. level of um, <laughs> the descriptiveness the poetic language i thought it was plotted mm. really well just from mm. the whole arc of it but it was just yeah, because I do. because it's such a like there's so much misery in this book and in some ways, it's mm. quite shocking. I don't know. Like, I feel because unlike... Mm. Yeah, no, I think you're right. I mean, this is what, about, I think, 50 years after Austin wrote her mm. her novels. So they are... And they, they're really yeah. going against the grain of not only being a female writer, but what female writers should mm. write about. In a similar way to Tenant of Wildfell Hall. Mm. Well, I was reading about this and... Um, yeah, we should do Tenant of Wildfell Hall comparisons. Emily said about about that, um, that she mm. she was really proud of Anne Bronte for not having shied away from some of yeah. the awfulness. You know, I, and I think... I can't, yeah. I can't remember which one was written first, actually, but I think they... The, mm. You know, these two sisters were the mm. ones that were very close. Mm. I think that probably did inspire mm. their writing... Um, in terms of yeah. like they were writing about the same thing. Yeah, Char- Charlotte was more on the line of you should because we're when eventually we're going to be known as female writers and we need to like yeah toe the line. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I think she. I get the impression that she was very conflicted about it and like you know the the mm. way the various things that she said about it and the way that she acted about it are reflective of that conflict. But like, um, it's still a very powerful book. Mm. Like I think you know it really does not. She doesn't beat around the bush with any of this. Yeah. She yeah, doesn't yeah. hide it behind like closed doors and smoke mm. and mirrors. The the level of mm. Yeah, physical and emotional abuse in this book yeah. did shock me because I, I, I knew mm. with Tenant of Welfare Hall, which we did in series one. Yeah. I, I sort of I was like, Okay, I am Emma said and Eli said it's a similar mm. like a similar mm. sort of I say vibe with mm. the like realness of it the similar tone and theme yeah yeah, yeah similar yeah. tone but it, it just surprised me i think yeah how much pop culture has mm. stripped away the entire nuance of this book and it's not mm. only that is the fact that all of the adaptations just focus on Catherine and heathcliff which yeah. is not in my it's not the plot of the book yeah like the, the it's not like why you're focusing on one third of the book if you've only watched a film adaptation mm. you're watching one third of the book and you're not focusing on the effect of the second generation mm. the, the, who were this first generation to set up this second yeah. generation yeah you, you you lose so much of what i think bronte was trying to say with the book yeah, yeah and exactly. I think the, mirror, the mirroring of it is really interesting because i feel like Everybody, everybody in the second generation, including Nelly, actually, is less mm. than the first. Yes, you know? they're, they're moderated. less intense. They're less charismatic. You don't. Yeah. They don't inspire the same levels of love and dread as the yeah. original generation do. You know. Mm. And in the end, is is that what is that what allows them to to break out of it? Is that the thing that allows them to go? Actually, I don't want to live like this anymore. How does that? Well, also, partly Nelly is narrating, right? And she grew up with the first generation, yeah. so they are more powerful mm. to her. They're going to inspire that love and dread in her in a way that the characters yeah, that she saw being true. born don't. So, yes, no, that's a good point. And I think as well, because she's tired at that point, yeah. because she, she, I don't think she is not putting her best self forward for the younger generation, right? She's like the, the tendencies we saw in her to withhold or give information depending on the circumstance oh, exaggerated with the second yeah she she leans into that because i think because she's tired it's the easiest option to cause the least drama to just tell kath kathy 2.0 to shut up and that she's not in love with mm-hmm. yeah. linton it's easier to just be like please stop you know i think anyone maybe who's dealt with young younger kids has yeah. had the experience of being like i'm so tired i just want you to stop no i cannot explain why you need to. No, I cannot explain why it's wrong. I'm so yeah. tired. Please just stop doing stupid yeah. I'm begging you. And that is, you know, that contributes heavily to the way that Kathy, like, is driven into 
the arms or not driven into but like the fact that she maintains that relationship at all Mm -hmm. you know and is in a position for Heathcliff to manipulate is because like yeah Nellie's just so f***ing tired of running around after these people because Nellie wouldn't tell her that actually Heathcliff is awful yeah Yeah. nobody will explain to her from Mm. when she would like literally she she grew up in Thrushcross Grange. She didn't know Wuthering Heights existed. Mm. Everyone just shut up about it. Yeah. And I, I guess it's kind of like clear. I feel what Emily Bronte was trying to get across with this is you mm. can't just, it, even if, yes, people are shit, but you can't just say, mm. just explain nothing because that also doesn't work. You have yeah. to give them a halfway house and just say, no, you can't mm. go and see this person because yeah. the father was not very nice. You don't have to go into it, but it was just yeah. like then you. Uh, but at the same time, you appreciate why Nelly's like, "I am sick of this bullshit." Yeah, I have to stay here because I am part of this household. But f- this, <laughs> or maybe a meta point: you can't just bury trauma and pretend it doesn't exist, which mm. is what Nelly is trying to do yeah. with younger Catherine. You have to confront it and move past yeah. it before you can truly heal, and that's yeah. what Kathy and mm. Herton end up doing and representing. Yeah. I was going to say Wuthering Heights is the mad woman in Thrush Crush Grain. Ah, Fancy House's Attic. Ha, yeah. You know, yeah. all of the buried of the previous mm-hmm. incarnation yeah. or whatever is in... Is I wanted to talk about Wuthering Heights actually being... Res- the house being responsible for all of this, actually. Because I want... Yeah. I th- the trauma is lodged in the house, yeah. you all. The mm. house is haunting everybody. The house makes people worse people. And the house yeah. falls into disrepair the, the worse mm. things are in it. Yes, yeah. yeah, yeah. And the house becomes a pleasant place. The the happier Hareton and Kathy are, the the better the house looks and the more yeah. the more uh-huh. it thrives and um is a good place to live, you know? And I, I, I'm really into the whole so we've got a couple of different hauntings in this book. Mm-hmm. I did actually want to ask you guys, do you think Kathy's really there? Do you think the ghost of Kathy is like is Heathcliff nah. really seeing her at the end? I couldn't I couldn't get behind a ghost story in this book. I don't know if that's mm. just because I, I didn't feel it matches. I feel it's too much going on. It's too mm. much. But Yeah, there are several different stories happening in this on different levels in this book. I think what it's doing is it's like using that ghost story mm. gothic like trope effectively mm. and using it in a way of you can't just bury the past and it, like yeah. you he's physically buried the past as in Catherine is physically buried he's mm. opened up the past again as in physically opened a coffin yeah. and now <laughs> hitting the fan because ghost Catherine has come back to haunt I him I mean the other <laughs> thing about the ghosts and sort of varying levels of reality in this book is that mm. Kathy one basically undergoes some pretty severe mental illness towards the end of her life like she has yes. brain fever m- yeah. multiple times and given that she and Heathcliff are are paired, you know they are. He is more mm. myself, etc. Yeah, it wouldn't. It would. It would fit for Heathcliff to, you know, also be mm. have be experiencing mental illness or hallucinations or. And it's never really made clear what he mm. dies of. He just kind of wastes away and stops eating. Yeah, he mm. just he goes to join her in a, a very like yeah odd. I mean, he he's sort of. It's interesting because on the one hand, he says, "Oh, you know." um, living is exhausting to me i've got everything i wanted you know i've got all of their property in the palm of my hand i i have all their children and it has a great joy the, the power to destroy everything beyond in, belonging to my enemies and now i just can't be asked uh-huh. even breathing is too much effort for me and yeah. then we get the whole kathy is haunting me i, I would eat ellen if if there wasn't a f- ghost staring at me you know, yeah, thing, and it's it's interesting because like, which of those has more sway on his health? You know, like, does he mm. just literally like the way he dies? I mean, they find him; he's just left the windows open overnight, and they walk in, and he's just like dead, grinning, staring up at the ceiling, dead. And it, he was in the prime of the uh, prime of life a week ago, and he's just gone. People die so young in this book. Oh my god! Mm, so there's yeah. this line where the doctor basically says, "Oh, um, him not eating was a symptom of the illness, not the cause of his death." But like, how much stock do we mm. put in the doctor's mm. words? You know. Yeah, the doctor's yeah. a bit shit. But I mean, I I tell you what, so this is both, I think it's both a strength and a weakness of the book. I found the the kind of, if if there are actually ghosts, this book may sen- makes sense to me and I'm fine with it. If there aren't mm-hmm. actually ghosts, I find the way Kath, both Catherine and Heathcliff die and the specific forms of like each other based derangement that they have baffling. And I don't... That's I, fair. It... it, it, it my brain just sort of prods at it yeah. as a as a like what's going on? I don't get this. 
kind of yeah i'm i'm like i'm lockwood in this scenario i'm just like yikes and walk away yeah you know yeah i was like well not getting involved in that and we just sidle over somewhere else i mean that's kind of where i'm at with the whole book i'm gonna be honest <laughs> <laughs> it's like lockwood at the end just goes I'm out. I refuse yeah. to have this tenancy. I am leaving for six months. I love the whole thing of like Ellen Dean trying to convince him to marry um, young Kathy to like get her out from that household. And this is before mm. she's married Het and Earnshaw and like her, her mm. happy ever after. Yeah. And Ellen Dean's trying to convince this, this, this lodger to like, oh, maybe you should strike up a friendship with her mm. and marry her. And he's just like, uh, no. Everybody's no. trying to feed the house. I'm still, I'm really on this, like, the house is the source of all the evil, right? Because, like, yeah. everybody who stays there, like, even pe- people like Isabella, she has a similar thing to Helen in Tenant of Wildfell Hall, where she yes. she loses her honesty, she loses her a sense of self-worth, she loses her, mm. like, I mean, she's mm-hmm. she manages to stay fairly moral, I think, by most people's standards within but that But part house. of that like, is she gets out. Yeah, she, yeah, yeah, she yeah. likes it. But being there makes her a worse person, right? It doesn't completely yes. ruin her, but it does. Being there makes her less. And um, Kathy two point is the same. Like she's a pretty, like she's a bit careless. She's a bit selfish as a kid, but she's not by any she's stretch 16, like a monster. You know? you know? Yeah, yeah. She's a mm. teenager. She's a teenager who was coddled quite a lot, you know. But once she's mm-hmm. been in, she's been stuck in Wuthering Heights with Heathcliff. She becomes cruel. She becomes vindictive, and I, in some ways, she's got to protect herself. I feel like it's like a change of like she's got to be in that house. Mm. She has to chameleon yeah. into someone who is foreign to herself. But they have because- to. They have to keep bringing new blood into the house. Well, yeah, but I think what I'm trying to say is that can that be attributed to the house, a, a, a place that makes yeah. you become worse? Because, because, yeah. like, I think. I think it's too easy to just blame Heathcliff, right? Because I think Heathcliff is a product Mm. of the people that he meets and the household he walks into. And it's an unhappy house that he walks into if he's able to derail it to that extent as a Mm 10-year-old, right? And I think it from a a character-based perspective... You can say Heathcliff is the source of all of the unpleasantness. You can you can argue that he is responsible mm. for the ways in which the next generation become terrible people. Become terrible people, yeah. quote, quote, unquote. But narratively, like he's a he's a he's a catalyst, not a, mm. a driving yeah. force. Yeah, and yeah, I think, yeah. But I think by the end, like he's taking more and more and more. Mm. He, it, it is entirely like people are living in fear of him yeah so at the start he's not of he's he is a mm. victim of the situation and as he goes becomes more of a villain mm. and he go he, he becomes more yeah more villainous and more of this, this planning mm. and i think hareton is a refutation of the idea that that was inevitable in some ways yes in that you know hareton is brought up by heathcliff and heathcliff is deliberately bringing him up to be the worst of himself we get the same parallels of um him not being educated him feeling degraded and stupid by by Mm -hmm. his circumstances and by the fact that other people run rings around him all of that but again one of the main differences is that like hareton is white like and hareton is technically a gentleman's son in the air you know there's like it's not a perfect mirroring in a lot of ways there was always a future for him out there that just wasn't for heathcliff yeah yeah yeah, yeah. even if heathcliff is doing his best to like keep that from him Mm. Mm. yes anyway i think that the house is haunted and that every time somebody marries in and i think even nelly trying to get people to marry in is the house trying to get blood the house is trying to Ah. get more people in you didn't watch haunting of hill house did you i didn't but i'm i love i like haunted houses okay i like the idea of them and I think that, yeah, the fact that Nellie Dean gets worse over the course of her life and her association with the house and that she wants mm. people to marry in, she wants to go back to the house. To me, yeah. I'm like, hmm, yeah. hmm, maybe the house is alive, actually. Anyway, we have gone very far in this. We should probably do, <laughs> we should probably do some other things. We should probably do a cat rating for starters. Oh, yeah, we should do a cat rating. <sighs> there is a cat in the book, very briefly, mm. in... Wuthering Heights there's a grey cat that shows up once yeah I don't think that's enough to really bump it up I don't know Lockwood also describes himself as a cat in laziness on several occasions <laughs> I, I can't say I don't think she'd enjoy this book I think it'd just be really? too mis- too. I don't no, know it's so dramatic and there's so that many attempted true. stabbings it's my view of the misery in this book clouding the cat rating. The integrity yeah. of the cat rating. I want to talk about one of my favourite moments of unintentional, I think unintentional comedy in this, which is like Hindley, Hindley of the older generation, drunk as a skunk, um, very yeah. angry with Nelly, 
put like threatens to kill her, has a kitchen knife at her, and she's like, "Oh man, don't kill me with that. I just cut fish with that. Can you get a clean knife?" <laughs> so funny. He's like, he literally puts the knife in her mouth, and she's like, "For fuck's sake, dude." The hygiene. The fish smell. Really? Can you not? And it's just so, <laughs> so funny. funny. <laughs> she's great. I like. I love her relationship with all the. I like. I'm, I. I mean. I do think the house gets to her, and I do think she's a worse person by the end than she is at the start. You know. But at the same time, I do enjoy watching her as a normal person react to their drama with just like, can you not? Are you done now? Have you finished with your tantrum? Put the gun down. Put the knife down. (laughs) Behave like a normal human being for once in your life. I'm begging you. Anyway, the reasons I think that I'm going to put my, I'm going to state my case. I'm going to state my case for a high cat rating. One, this book is extremely (laughs) dramatic. It is. That is true. Mm -hmm. Two, this book is extremely (laughs) gothic. Yes. True. Three, many people are almost stabbed in this book. <laughs> also true. That is also yeah. true. Um, and four, there are actual cats. There is one cat. There is a whole entire there cat, is one cat and then a human who claims to be one. I, I feel I'd have to give it, a, like, I I don't know. I'm just cl- being clouded by my own, like, oh, God, this book was miserable. <laughs> But the thing is, I feel like... Like, no, it's bad. It's just, it's very sad. <laughs> Mind you, we've had books we've liked that we thought the cat wouldn't rate highly. It's not about mm. whether or not we like that it. That is true. I, I, you know, I, yeah. I find Em's argument pretty persuasive here. Mm. Yeah. I, guess I have one last point I that I would like to make, which I think is that Gothmog in many ways would be Lockwood seeing oh, this yeah. story. This right? is She's going to find it extremely entertaining and then just walk away. She's yep. not yep. going to get invested. She's going to find it extremely f- funny it's like well there's a melodrama happening in that haunted house guess i better go back to london bye <laughs> she would do that that is a very cat vibe yeah it's like i'm gonna stoke the drama and then i'm just gonna leave <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so what are we saying are we saying an eight are we saying higher than an eight? i want to say an eight I, i'm i'm gonna plump for an eight okay i i, I, <laughs> I, I think your, your arguments are persuasive i'll go for an eight <laughs> i was gonna say we should probably do because this is a classic we need mm. to put an f-bomb in it we do. Yeah. It's our it's our moral duty to put an F bomb um, in this classic. Where would you say? Um, Who gets ooh. it? What's funniest? I ooh, I say I f- I feel like child like Kathy two point <laughs> Kathy two point I feel deserves it. <laughs> AU where they realise that she's been visiting Wuthering Heights this whole time because she stubs her toe and this beautiful angel blonde ringlets never said a bad word in yeah. her life just goes. <laughs> at the top of her voice and they're all like where did you hear this language or the bit where nelly nelly like burns all the letters or like something like that yeah but i also kind of think i feel Mm. also so there's there's a groomsman who gets the horse ready for Mm. kathy 2.0 to go riding across Mm. the moors i kind of also feel he should get it because he seems hard done by yeah he he, he's gonna have his job like he's got an insecure job here and he's like oh (laughs) f*** this like (laughs) i I think he should get it i also appreciate that he's being bribed by books that's a man after my own heart yeah exactly so i feel he should get that oh f*** you (laughs) (laughs) i tell you what my other feeling with this with the f-bomb is that Every, I, f- I don't get the impression that there are many characters in this book who wouldn't swear when they felt like it. Yeah. Actually. Mm. I think the Lintons probably don't. I think the Lintons are a f- free household. But mm. if they were, it would have made this whole book much simpler. It would, it's true. Yeah, that is true. We half the characters. <laughs> I mean, I would say who, who, who in this book do you want to fight? But for me, it'd probably be just like every single person no no fighting if you fight them then you're invested and then you get sucked into the house and it exactly. eats you and you're never seen again just walk away don't walk fight away. anyone just walk away no I disagree I will fight I do I do think punching Lockwood would be funny but just because I, I, I want to yeah. see what he'd do <laughs> I would fight Daddy Earnshaw who may or may not be Heathcliff's mm, dad okay yeah. yeah I would I would knock him out cold because he's a <laughs> wuss and then I would adopt Heathcliff mm. and take him far away yeah and then be like, have a normal childhood. Yeah, that's valid. And if we are leave- we're leaving aside the possibility that it's the house's fault, yeah. I think yeah. he is definitely the person most to blame so for could, all could of you, this. So could you fight the house by knocking it down? I don't know. <laughs> well, even Heathcliff couldn't bring himself to do it. He was like, I, the yeah. whole point of me getting um, hold of these buildings was so I could destroy them, and now I just can't be asked. Which, could, again, is this the house working through yeah, him? The house is like, you can't knock me down. Yeah, points towards the house having agency <laughs> to work against him. Yeah. <laughs> 
Wow, that was a there was a lot. There was a lot in that. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I've I've just noticed the uh the the, the clock guys. Um Yeah, no, we are we are very much on the wrap up. <laughs> we, end we, of are this on the wrap up. we are on the wrap up. So shall we quickly just go over what else we're reading outside of podcast land? It's cute that you think I have the energy to read. I nearly didn't finish this book. I nearly I finished it this morning because I have had a bastard week and I have read nothing else. <laughs> I'm about to be really boring and say I'm reading uh, driving theory books because I want to learn to drive. <laughs> Oh wow! Yeah. It still counts. That is it's extremely a book boring. And you're reading it, so I mean, to be fair, I I sympathies, mon frere. I've read. I've I've been listening to a little bit of Sense and Sensibility for a future episode, mm. and I was going to read more of um, conversations with people, but then the library app, someone else rented it, so I have to wait two weeks till I get it back again to finish that. Alas, so I watched Big Hero Six instead on Disney Plus. So that's mm-hmm, how that's mm-hmm, how mine mm-hmm. went. Nice. Yeah, that seems pretty good. Seems pretty good. <laughs> I'm enjoying Only Murders in the Building. That's my current TV thing. Uh, oh, I watched. Um, yeah. if, if anyone, any listeners, I watched Squid Game. Very good. Just to date this episode. That's that's that's. I current. don't think that's my cup of tea. It sounds good, but I don't no, think that's my no, cup of tea. No, no, it's absolutely not yours. It's definitely not M's. Um, it absolutely is mine, and I really enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard good things. I've heard good things. But I tell you what, I'm very excited about our our next episode, which is technically our Christmas episode, but we're recording these in advance, so I'm gonna have to like crack the tinsel out to get in the Christmas vibes early. Uh-huh. <laughs> we're reading the Ho- Hogfather by Terry Pratchett, and I'm so excited to discuss it. Yes. Oh, it's gonna be so good. It's so good. I love I love death, and I love Susan, and I love it's the ho- like so the Hogfather good. is just. Mm. So if you if you haven't read it already. It is a very short book. You've got two weeks to read it from the release of this episode. Get it, read it, listen to our episode. Yeah, really <laughs> read it, listen to the episode. And um, But yeah, thank you all so much for listening. Remember to follow us on your podcast platform so you never miss an episode when it goes out. And give us a like or a review if you enjoyed this episode. You can also connect with us on our socials. We've got our email, teachingmycattoread at gmail.com. And all the links to our socials are in the description box below. And we also have a Goodreads group. So you can have all the bookish chat with fellow podcast listeners. So say hello, send us a message and recommend us some books to read. Big virtual hugs and we'll see you next time. Bye. 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 Bye.